It always feels good when you are appreciated. SLT Non-Stop Broadband. Free loyalty data added as you stay connected. Link at the time of the day, you will be able to get the money. Mom, what is it? Let's go. Tonight, return of the burqa. Sectoral Oversight Committee on National Security recommends ban on face covering attire. More backsliding. Inaction over a Turkish letter warning of FATO terrorists on Sri Lankan soil, revealed before the Presidential Commission. SLC deals. Sri Lanka cricket grilled by the COPE as corruption comes to light. Mother Language Day. Professor G.L. Pires outlines the role of language in bringing the nation together. We are trying to bring our nation together to emphasize the things that we have in common rather than the things that divide us. And I think language is key. All that and much more coming up on First at Nine. This Friday, the 21st of February, 2020. From Adha Derana, this is Adha Derana First at Nine. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Welcome to First at Nine. I'm Dhamma Kekanaika. Let's start with your local stories. Now, the report compiled by the Sectoral Oversight Committee on National Security has submitted its report to Parliament, making various recommendations. It has been tabled by Chairman of the Committee, Parliamentarian Malik Jayathilaka. Some of the key recommendations made in the report is the banning of face covering garb such as burqa, as well as banning the registration of political parties based on ethnicity and religion. The Sectoral Oversight Committee on National Security has made suggestions to the Parliament to ban face covering attire such as the burqa and to suspend the registration of political parties on ethnic and religious basis. These suggestions were made in a special report presented to the Parliament offering solutions to 14 controversial issues in the community following the Easter attacks. The report was presented to the Parliament by the Chairman of the Committee, MP Malit Jayatilaka. It points out that currently many countries have banned the burqa and that the ISIS headquarters in Syria too banned the attire on the 5th of September last year. The report suggests that the police should have the power to request any person wearing a face covering in a public place to take it off in order to establish the identity of that person. If such a request by a police officer is not complied with, police should have the power to arrest the individual without a warrant. The report has also made recommendations to the Election Commission to enact legislation to suspend the registration of political parties based on ethnic and religious grounds. Accordingly, the report recommends banning registration of parties with racial or religious conflict in their relevant party names or constitutions and if such a party currently exists, it should be converted into a non-racial or non-religious political party within a specified period of time of two to three years. Further, all students studying in madrasa institutions should be absorbed into the normal school system under the Ministry of Education within a period of three years. The committee rejects the earlier proposal of the madrasa institutions to be brought under the Ministry of Education and suggests that madrasa schools should only function for the education of Maulavis after completing an education of GCE ordinary and advanced levels. The report also proposes the establishment of a special committee to regulate madrasa institutions under the Department of Muslim Religious and Cultural Affairs. The document consists of a number of recommendations in the field of education, including the curriculum taught in all Islamic educational institutions, being subjected to approval by the National Institute of Education and the appointment of a recognized expert panel for the editing of the upcoming Islamic textbooks. 
It also contains recommendations on 14 areas, including the national defense policy, amending the immigration and immigration law in line with the national and international new developments, the manner of amending the Muslim marriage and divorce law, timely requirement for the amendment of WAKF Act, halal certification process and establishment of a Ministry of Religious Affairs with all religions. Now it was revealed before the Presidential Commission on Off Inquiry probing these to Sunday attacks today that back in 2016 a letter from Turkey had notified the Minister of Foreign Relations of FATO terrorists being in Sri Lanka. What's more, despite the letter being forwarded to the Ministry of Defence, action had not been forthcoming. Acting Deputy Directors of the Counter-Terrorism Unit at the Ministry of Foreign Relations, Mahisha Bharati Jayavardhana, and Acting Additional Secretary of the Law and Order Section at the Ministry of Defence, Malika Srimati Piris, gave evidence before the Presidential Commission of Inquiry probing the Easter Sunday attacks today. The attention of the Commission fell on the 12-page letter sent by Turkish Ambassador Tunka Ostruhada on the 24th of August in 2016, noting that a group belonging to the Turkish terror group FETO arriving in Sri Lanka. When asked whether such a letter was received by the Ministry of Foreign Relations, Jayavardhana said that it did. She added that present Foreign Secretary Ravinata Arya Singha was the Secretary of the Counter-Terrorism Unit during that time. The Commission questioned as to why the letter in question was sent to the Western Unit of the Ministry of Foreign Relations instead of forwarding it to the Counter-Terrorism Section. In reply, Javardana said that the file forwarded to the Director General of the Western Unit was sent to the Counter-Terrorism Unit at the Ministry of Defence on the 30th of April in 2019 after the Easter attacks. The Commission then expressed its amazement over the file being sent on the same day as then State Minister of Foreign Relations Vasanta Sinanayaka addressed a media briefing on the matter after no action being taken over the file for so long. Mahesha Bharati Jayavardhana meanwhile added that the Secretary in charge of Law and Order at the Ministry of Defence was made aware of the letter sent by Turkey. Commission then questioned Acting Additional Secretary of the Law and Order Unit at the Ministry of Defence Malika Srimati Piris. When the Commission quizzed her on the letter from Turkey indicating the presence of FATO terrorists in Sri Lanka, she said the letter was received by the coordinator at the Ministry, a senior superintendent of police, from the Ministry of Foreign Relations on the 24th of August in 2016. She identified him as Varnajay Sundara, who is also the coordinating secretary of the Ministry's secretary. She added that the 12-page letter was sent to IGP Pujit Jai Sundara for appropriate action to be taken. When asked whether observations were called on the information given by the letter, she responded saying that Pujit Jai Sundara requested observations. She however added that since the notification was done by the coordinating officer and not the ministry's secretary, as it should have been done, she cannot attest to accuracy of the procedure. When asked whether the defence ministry inquired the matter from the IGP, she said it was done on the 2nd of February in 2020 and its reply came under the signature of DIG Ajit Rohana on the 12th of February. She also noted that information regarding that was later sent to the State Intelligence Service. When asked whether there was a reply to that, she said she cannot find it as there isn't a designated file for it, making it difficult to locate it. Now, Prime Minister Mahindra Rajpaksha believes that the opposition backing out of supporting a supplementary estimate to the interim budget in Parliament yesterday is an act of callousness as it prevented arrears being paid to various people and firms who rendered their services during the previous government. Addressing an event today, the Premier also moved to say that leaders in the government are more experienced than those in the opposition and that the sole function of the opposition is not to make indiscriminate objections. Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa took part in the first national conference organised by the Sri Lanka Gramaniladari Association at the Kandian Cultural Centre today. Janadi 
අපි ගත්ත ණය බේරන්න නෙවෙයි දහනමේ ගත්ත ණය බේරන්න කොම්පැනි වලට අපි ගෙවිය යුතු මුදල් ගෙවලා අපි සල්ලි ටිකක් ඉතින් ගමට යවන්න ලෑස්ති වෙනකොට විපක්ෂයේ එකට විරුද්ධ වුණා මොකද විපක්ෂයේ හිතු ආ මෝඩයෝ වගේ මේක දාලා එයාලට පුළුවන් වෙයි කියලා පරද්දන්න ඊට වඩා මතක තියා ගන්න ඕන විපක්ෂයේ ඉන්න නායකයන්ට වඩා බලපුරුදු දේශපාලන කණ්ඩායමක් දාන පක්ෂයෙන් මෙයාලා පරද්දනවා කියලා දැනගත් විගස අපි මේක ඉදිරිපත් කරේ නැහැ මේ යාළගේ අර මානසික තෘප්තිය ලබන්න අපි ඊට දිවේ නැහැ මොකද ඒකෙන් උනේ මොකක්ද අර වැඩ කරපු කම්කරුවන්ට උන්ගේ සිංහල අවුරුද්ද අවුරුද්ද කණ්ඩ කීයක් හරි දරුවන් එක්ක අලුත් ඇඳුමක් ඇඳ ගන්න තිබිච්ච අවස්ථාවක් විපක්ෂයේ තියෙන කුහකකම නිසා ඒක වැළකුණා විපක්ෂයක ඉන්නයි කියන එකෙන් අදහස් කරන්නේ හැමදේටම විරුද්ධ වෙන එක නෙවෙයි Meanwhile Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa took part in the launch of a new stamp that marked the start of Sri Lanka's sustainable decade at the postal headquarters last evening. In the meantime, State Minister of Development Banking and Loan Scheme Shahan Seema Singh believes that the opposition not backing yesterday's amendment to the vote on account in parliament will not have any impact on the government's ability to service debt. Addressing a media briefing, the state minister went on to say that the United National Party should take responsibility for driving the country towards an economic crisis and for blocking the government's attempts to rectify the situation. With regards to this uh, amendment, what we brought in will not have a negative impact on debt servicing. We have planned debt servicing especially for the first quarter. There is absolutely no issue in that. We are talking of a borrowing limit of 367. The appropriation bill has a limit of 721 billion. So we are asking to raise the borrowing limit by this 367 billion, which is equivalent to the debts that you have to pay the suppliers who have supplied in 2019 for the government. Because there is appropriation bill which has given the finances for the first quarter, we have asked for this additional money to be paid for 2019. The opposition should have taken responsibility in what they have done because they led the country into economic crisis on top of it when we want to sort it out. If you see, the contractors were hand-picked by them. Hand-picked UNPS and the JVPS. And they should understand the fact that they are blocking payments of UNPS and JVPS who are hand-picked during their government. So soon uh, the leader of the opposition, Sajid Premadasa, took office, he pledged support in parliament. And if he is ready to be the next prime minister under Gotabe Rajapaksa regime, so with this act, he has completely disqualified himself. They say the expenditure is approved, but uh, finding money to pay the expenditure is, is not approved. Meanwhile, opposition leader Sajid Premadasa today called on the chief prelates of the Malwat and Askiriya chapters. Speaking to media afterwards, he once more gave an explanation as to why the opposition did not back the government in parliament yesterday. Opposition leader Sajid Premadasa visited the Malwatha temple in Kandy this morning and had an audience with chief prelate of the Malwatha chapter, Most Venerable Thibatuave Sri Sumangala Thera. The opposition leader brought the chief prelate up to speed on the duties and tasks that he had carried out since he assumed duties. Afterwards, the opposition leader called on the chief prelate of the Askiriya chapter, Most Venerable Varakagoda Sri Jnana Ratana Thera. Subsequently, the opposition leader spoke to media on the decision made by the UNP in yesterday's parliamentary sitting. ये तुरु सम्मत गिनुमक ने इधरी पात करे पार्लिमेंट वाटा योजना ये योजना वे कोटस देखते बुना पालेवनी कोटसे समाई संगर्दन क्रिया दामे देवनी कोटसे समाई नायगण न सीमा वन यहल दमी अपि पालेवनी कोटसे टा पक्षे बुना संगर्दन क्रिया दामे अनवल नमूत नया सीमा वन यहल दमाला नया रगे न तवदुरटा त्रटे � now, during yesterday's proceedings of the Committee on Public Enterprises, Sri Lanka cricket was dumbfounded when questioned about a sum of 25 million rupees, which is half of the original sum agreed upon to be paid as a donation to the Malwatha Temple for acquiring land on lease. It was also revealed that the SLC had paid the pay tax of former coach Chandika Hathrasingha, who was recruited as the head coach of the national side in 2017. Sri 
ඒකේ වර්තමාන තත්ත්වේ මොකද්ද දැන් බදු පදනම් මත ඉඩමක් අත්පත් කර ගැනීම තමයි තියෙන්නේ. ඒ කියන්නේ මේකේ දෙවනි කාරණේ තිබුණේ තක්සියරු කරුගේ තක්සියරු වාර්තාව ලැබීමට පෙර මුළු බදු කාලය වන වසර 30ට අදාළ බදු කුලිය මිලියන 26.25ක් පමණක් ලෙස එකගව එම බදු මුදලද ඉක්ම වූ මිලියන 50ක් පරිත්‍යාග ලෙස ලබා දීමට විධායක සභාව විසින් තීරණය කර තිබුණා කියලා. එම පරිත්‍යාග කිරීමට තීරණය කළ මුදල පිළිබඳ බෞද්ධ කටයුතු කොමසාරිස්ද දැනුවත් කර නොතිබිණි. මිලියන් 50ක පරිත්‍යාගයක් තමයි විධායක සභාව විසින් තීරණය කළ තියෙන දැන්න. හරි අපි දුන්නේ 25යි. දැන් ඉතුරු මිලියන 25ක වූ. අපි ඒක කාටවක් කා දුන්නේ නැහැ සභාපතිතුමා. එතන රැවැට්ටීමක් කළ තියෙන මහනායක හම්බුරු. ඇත්තටම ඒක අපිට වමනාවක් වුණා. වමනාවක් වුණ නැති වෙන්න බෑනේ. කන්සල්ට් ඕනේ දී. ඔබ තුමාලා තීරණය කළත් තාම නැහැ. දෙන්න හෝ නොදෙන්න හම්බුරු දන්නෙත් නැහැ. දැන් මේකේ एजी के रिपोर्ट के दिए ना मालवत पास हुए तो लबादु नेहत मतलब आये थे ने गिनुं वाले खेरी के ना वैरल ऐसा सावध जल ऐसा गिनुं का तकरार थी भी नहीं एक ने एवीसी पहाड़ वो काटिया हर ये टा अकाउंट कर लाने में क्लासिफिकेशन ने रे काटती बुना विगन का अधिपतुमा गिया और रुद्दे दें देदास दाहना में अकाउंट मिलियनिकल It was also revealed that the local cricket governing body had paid an amount of 150 million rupees to the former coach of Sri Lanka cricket Chandika Hathru Singh including pay tax. Ilaga ticket kanda am suda jatika puhunu karu eku bandawa gen. Chandika Hathru Singh neda bandawa gan tibune ohuta 2017 esila 2019 dakka gewu mudala million 153 ki Sri Lanka cricket aayathane wisin puhunu karu gen adu karagena gewu yutu tibu upaya nevita gewim badu puhunu karu wenuwen aayathane badu gewimata ekanga wiyom mata million 15 kut 530700 ka wedamak dara tibu. Tawada ohuge gewim මට ගෙවිය යුතු බදු ගණනයේදී ඇතම් ආදායම් නොසලකා හැරීම හේතුවෙන් එකතුව 15,93,455 ආදායම් බදු මුදලක් දේශීය ආදායම් දෙපාර්තමේන්තුව තුළ ගෙවීම පැහැර හැර තිබුණි කියලා. ඒ කාලේ සභාපතිතුමා අපේ ලංකාවේ කිසිම තිබුණු කරු ලංකාවට එන්නේ නැති තත්ත්වයක් තිබ්බේ. ඒ කින්ද එතුමා වංගලි දේශවල හිටියේ. අපි ඔක්කොම හිතුවා එයා හොඳම පුහුණු කරු කියලා තමයි අපි එයාව ගෙන්න ගත්තේ. ඒ නිසාද මේ ප්‍රමාණය ගෙවන්න සිද්ධ වුණේ? ඔව්. We'll see you again shortly after this break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're watching First at Nine. Dr. Indrajit Aponso says Sri Lanka embracing a culture of leading by example will give the country's development drive hope for prosperity. Joining a panel discussion, the senior lecturer at the Economics Department of the University of Colombo highlighted that the national policy framework should go in line with the political commitment while applauding an emerging culture of discipline in the country's public sector. Productive citizenry includes productive processes of all economic agents, the private sector, the government, the policies, and also the civil society who are stakeholders in this. The discipline and just society, this is again something that we have not taken into very serious consideration, at least in a strategic way, that we complain everywhere we have a serious inherent problem. lack of discipline and the society which is not quite a collective society we are more like individuals these two aspects need attention technology based society is something uh, which is very much important in the current context but at the same time it could be double edged as well unless it is handled right because it might leave out as it has seen it was seen in some of the other societies where certain segment of the society is unable to cope with that technology so which means you are sort of leaving behind a large chunk of people at least in the short term the discussion that's going on in the society is that the policy framework and the political commitment the president has displayed by action what role the politician should play in the development so if that is to something go by this gives a unique hope and a prospect that we are about to launch a process of development that is sincere and close to people's expectations at least in the political framework the critical elements in the development process is the public sector in this area to a new culture and discipline appear to be emerging and it has raised the hopes of new vistas if the evidence so far is anything to go by a major component of development equation looks promising 
It is noteworthy that we have never estimated the past political culture had been accountable for development wars in this country. Because much of the studies are more on the economic side, but there has not been a quantification of how much the politics played in our current uh, scenario of lagging development. And it is the emerging opinion that the contemporary political culture and conduct have been quite large and extremely growth retarding. In other local stories, former Minister of External Affairs, Professor G. L. Piris, portrays language as the key to unite the nation in emphasising the things that the nation possess in common. He touched on the matter while addressing the national celebration of the International Mother Language Day this morning. The national celebration of the International Mother Language Day was worked off this morning at the Independence Square. The event was also graced by Prime Minister Mahindra Rajpaksha, foreign envoys and top government officials. We are trying to bring our nation together to emphasise the things that we have in common rather than the things that divide us. And I think language is key. See, it is my firm conviction that at the root of some of the country's problems is the stratification of society. This is there in our schools and in our universities. Students are educated in completely separate streams. They do not have the opportunity of relating to each other. Not only their lectures, their tutorials, their seminars, but even their sports activities, their cultural lives are entirely separate. And if you don't know what the other man is thinking, then over time, feelings of suspicion, hostility, alienation are bound to be nurtured in the human mind. So if you are to address that, you must start young. Painting, like song, letters, is another language, a very profound language which tend to ignore and which can actually unify us, uh, where there's no borders, no lines, nothing. And it only enthuses us, it only excites us. And uh, the theme of this year, as we are observing, we said language for unity. Let's not harp in the past or let's not harp in the fact that what could have been done, but let's try to show that what can be done and uh, through which actually how we can connect with our future generation, our posterity. We should be well aware that the use of high-end technology devices in this globalized era is a threat for the sustainability of mother languages. We must make our efforts to protect and perceive its value by using it with them as well as outside our motherlands. Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh share many common historic, cultural and geographical features. Among them, the most important factor is the Sanskrit language. The root of all our mother languages, which is the main reason of our parallel cultures. The body of the police constable who was reported missing from the area of Kadavata since Monday was found today in Verahara, Pannala. Two suspects have been arrested over the alleged murder of the constable. On the 18th of February, three police teams were deployed in Kankanimula woods in the area of Kuliapitya in search of the missing constable attached to the Kadavata police. During the search operation, several blood stains were discovered. However, the body of the constable or any of his effects were not found. The deceased was identified as a 37-year-old father of two from Virakatia who had been serving at the cut of the police as a constable driver. It is reported that the constable had been involved in an extramarital affair with a woman from Kadavata who is said to be the spouse of a drug convict. Her son is one of the two people arrested over the murder. Now the Monterey Board, with the concurrence of the Minister of Finance, Eco Economy and Policy Development, has appointed Assistant Governor K. M. Mahinda Sirivardhana as the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, with effect from the 12th of February this year. Sirivardhana has a service of more than 28 years in the Central Bank and prior to his appointment as a Deputy Governor, he held the position of Assistant Governor in charge of Economic Research Department and Statistics Department. Sirivardhana has also served as the Director of the Economic Research Department of the Central Bank. From July 2017 to October 2019, Sirivardhana was on release to the International Monetary Fund as the Alternative Executive Director for India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh and Bhutan. We'll be back after this break. Don't go away.
Welcome back. You're watching First at Nine. Now, dozens of protesters in a Ukrainian town have attacked buses carrying evacuees from coronavirus hit China. The evacuees were brought to health to a health spa rather in Novi Sanzare in the central Poltava region, where they will be held in quarantine for 14 days. Ukraine Security Service said a fake email claiming to be from the health ministry had falsely stated that some evacuees had contracted the virus. According to officials, the SBU have now launched an investigation into the matter. Ukraine has no confirmed cases of the new coronavirus, which originated last year in China's Hubei province. In cricket, Indian women's team defeated the four-time T20 champions Australia in the opening match of the ICC Women's T20 World Cup this evening. The match was worked off in the showground stadium in Sydney. Australia won the toss and elected to bowl first. At Australia's invitation, India scored 132 runs at the end of their 20 overs. Australia, however, could only muster 115 runs in 19.5 overs, making India winners in the opening match. Poonam Yadav was awarded the man of, or woman of the match, I should say, for her outstanding bowling figures as she bagged four wickets for 19 runs. And that's it from all of us here at First at Nine. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.